Hi, my name is David Mosier and I work as a web developer at Test Double. And today I'd like to talk to you about something I call the empathy equation. Uh, this is a talk that I'm going to be giving at Prairie DevCon for the first time. And it's my first ever soft talk. Uh, and I wanted to pick a topic that I felt was something that I had enough personal experience to talk about, but also something that I feel really needs some unpacking in the context of the IT industry. Uh, the format of this talk is split into two sections. In the first half, uh, which is called understanding empathy, I'm gonna try to unpack empathy in a way that's relevant to people working in IT. The second half is called developing empathy, and it focuses on strategies that you can implement uh, in order to grow your empathetic capacity. Just a brief note on the format of this talk. I know this is a, a screencast recording, but um, the slides are purposefully light on text and really focus on visual concepts, um, but I will have a URL with resources that you can check out in the video description so that you can go and look for books or authors or people that I'm going to highlight as positive resources at the end of this. Um, and I'd like this really to be more of a bi-directional uh, talk as far as communication goes and, and an open conversation instead of just a traditional presentation. So if you have, uh, something relevant that you feel you'd like to share, please reach out and uh, get in touch with me on Twitter or come talk to me after the presentation and interject. Um, and everyone I'm sure that is listening would uh, appreciate the context that you have to add. So has everyone seen the Lego movie? Uh, this is probably familiar to you if you have seen the Lego movie. If not, you really should. It's a, an intelligent, entertaining movie that has some interesting underlying themes that are relevant to a discussion on understanding and developing empathy. In the movie, there exist two groups of people, one filled with uh, people living completely oblivious to the fact that they're under subjugation to a manipulative governing authority led by a tyrant named Lord Business, played by Will Ferrell's character. You can see him in the, the upper left of the screen there, looking maniacally on in the background. Um, this the authority led by Will Ferrell has basically eliminated all freedom of thought um, and expression through mass media control and extreme micromanagement of creativity, which is the currency of expression um, in the Lego universe uh, setting for the movie. And he's done so by controlling the authorization and distribution of the Lego set building instructions. So in the movie, uh, all of the people that are part of this society that's under subjugation, they go to work, they go about their daily lives, they follow the instructions, they don't deviate from them, and that sort of the, the, the opening set for the movie. Um, the other group of people in the movie is known as a group, of rebel, a, re, a group of rebels known as the Resistance. And they're seeking to end the subjugation of the first group of people by establishing creativity and freedom um, of expression as publicly accepted societal norms. And the way that they're doing this is trying to promote creativity, um, that we, the idea that we don't have to follow the instructions. And the central conflict in the film is a clash between these two ideologies. And I think if we think about the state of our industry, the IT industry, that's who this talk is targeted at, we can draw some interesting parallels to the themes in the film. Firstly, we often struggle, and when I say we, I mean the, the IT industry, we often struggle with a monoculture uh, where diversity is a challenge. Uh, diversity in hiring, uh, in thought, in representation in our industry, uh, in terms of um, demographics. Secondly, we can often get sucked into a group think mentality um, where challenging the status quo doesn't happen due to fear of reprisal. In the movie, that happens a lot. There's people that are just wanting to go about their daily lives and, and follow the instructions and not deviate from things. Thirdly, I think it's sometimes easier for us to think that we, uh, in the IT industry, um, it's easier to just live under the facade that everything's awesome uh, and not tackle the hard conversations or the hard topics like diversity or empathy or things like that. These are large scale or macro problems. And I think it's easy for us to get sucked into debates in various channels. Uh, I've seen it explode on Twitter, um, internet comments, which are horrible, Facebook, all these mediums of communication that are really horrible for this type of discussion. And yet we seem to focus so much about solutions to these macro problems. Um, but in reality, solving those types of problems uh, of larger scale is a lot more nuanced than the, the communication mediums that we typically talk in. And the level of granularity that our arguments typically support in those channels doesn't really serve the purpose of trying to solve those large problems. And the reason I bring this thing, this topic up is I, I firmly believe that it's important to consider the macro problems that our industry faces, things like diversity uh, and representation uh, in demographics. Um, but I think we should also uh, 
look at the focus of in order to improve on any of these issues, we need to focus more on the micro level issues. Um, and really, that's what the focus of this talk is about, which is about personal growth, managing conflict and learning to relate to one another with empathy. So while I think um, it's important to recognize those high level problems, this talk is not designed to bring forward solutions to them. So next, I'd like to talk, uh, take some time to frame a few of the points I made in the session abstract um, as a way to highlight some of the themes that I would like you to think about as you walk away from this talk. In the session abstract, I said, as a community of developers, we need to place a priority on seeking interdependence instead of independence in our technology choices, our hiring practices, and the way that we interact with team members. So the question that I'd like to pose today is firstly, what do we use to evaluate our success as software developers, designers, people working in IT? Um, in my experience, it is narrowly focused on primarily our technical expertise. Things like how many programming languages you know. Uh, can you confidently declare that you're a polyglot, somebody that knows a lot of programming languages? How many projects have you completed? The number of years of experience you have delivering software. Or maybe something like how strong your command line kung fu is. Uh, I worked with a guy and somebody referred to him as, um, he's god mode for Unix. These are all things that reflect the technical expertise or the technical capability of people. Um, and they're not bad in and of themselves, but taking together as the sole criteria for evaluating an individual's success um, is one of the main reasons we're currently facing some of those macro level challenges I mentioned before, uh, diversity and monoculture groupthink. And I firmly believe that the right approach to evaluating the success of an individual working in IT needs to balance the equation by offsetting technical expertise with our ability to coexist in harmony with our teammates and coworkers. We need to move from a focus of independence in technical expertise to one of interdependence, how we can work together in a group, how we can leverage other people's strengths. Uh, and there's some nuance and things that we'll dive into later in the discussion. But the first thing I think that this starts with, this shift from independence and a focus on technical expertise to interdependence and how we work with each other uh, and coexist um, and empathize, starts with uh, admitting some of our weaknesses. The second part of the, the session abstract for this talk says, creating a healthy team begins by putting everyone on a level emotional playing field. We're all broken in one way or another. And the first step to eliminating unhealthy team environments is figuring out how to admit that honestly. So let's unpack that because that's a pretty dense statement. Um, but I think if you were able to deconstruct everyone in your current work environment in a transparent manner, and if people were comfortable sharing all of their character flaws, we would be able to have that level emotional playing field. Now that's not reality. And to be honest, getting to that point in a team environment is hard. People don't typically wear their character flaws on their sleeves or go about proclaiming their weaknesses for all the world to hear. And this makes sense. Often this type of information uh, can be used against people. So our natural defense mechanism is to withdraw and be silent and keep that stuff hidden from plain view. Rarely do we feel that we're in a group of people we trust enough not to judge us harshly based on our admission of a character flaw. But I consider that the most successful team environments that I've been in or on were filled with people who did this well, who shared their character flaws. And when you have a high level of emotional intelligence on a team, it disarms people's defense mechanisms, especially if everyone is committing to that shared pool of meaning and that shared pool of ideas, um, admitting their flaws, being forward with what their true feelings are. And there's a higher level of trust that there's not gonna be judgment and things like that. Learning how to recognize that we all have character flaws helps us to empathize. And this is something that we'll take a look at a little bit later in the talk. The last point of the session abstract says, if we're to move forward together, we need to talk about the hard things, how to cultivate empathy, when to speak up, when to stay quiet, how to build trust and how to handle conflict without imploding. The last theme of the talk is about cultivation, and there's many definitions of cultivation, but in this context, I like to think of it as promoting growth or development. Often we focus on cultivating our technical expertise, as I mentioned before, but at the expense of cultivating our capacity towards empathy. And I think that's a real serious mistake, um, but one that's actually easily remedied with a few simple strategies that we're going to investigate in the second half of the talk on developing empathy. First, let's dive into understanding empathy to help frame the context for developing empathy. So empathy as defined in the dictionary is the psychological identification with the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of others. 
And I think any talk on empathy, uh, it can go in a number of different directions. But for the purposes of our audience, people working in the IT industry, I'd like to focus more on some actionable steps that we can take to get better at identifying with the feelings, thoughts, and attitudes of others. More of a practical approach. So how do we get to that point of being able to have that psychological identification? Firstly, I think we need to start by clearing up some misconceptions about empathy. People I have heard say empathy is a superpower. They Sometimes we look at others who are capable of um, empathy as having this superpower. Why is that? Might be for a number of reasons. We might think that we lack sensitivity, uh, context, understanding, um, or the ability to relate to that person. Sometimes they're people that we might not necessarily get along with. Um, maybe it's just completely mysterious to us why people would act in a certain way uh, in, a, in a situation. And another reason, perhaps we judge other actions, more, others' actions more harshly than we do our own. Maybe, maybe you can identify with this, maybe we're just apathetic and burnt out in our current environment that we've abandoned hope. Maybe all of the above. Those could be reasons why uh, we look at somebody with empathy and, and, and think that they have a superpower. And I've been in a number of work environments where I was able to observe an individual skilled at navigating a difficult situation. And I often wondered how they were so able to effectively um, achieve a positive outcome. And for me, it wasn't until I read a fantastic book uh, called Crucial Conversations. You can see it right here, and I'll put a link to it at the end. Um, that it clicked for me. A capacity for empathy is not a mystical psychological attribute that some people have and others don't. Um, some people are better at it, but I firmly believe that it's because they've spent more time practicing their skill. And it is something that you can practice, and we'll dig into that in a, in a second. But it, it's not imbued by your upbringing uh, or the support of your parents and peers. It's something that is a learnable skill. It takes practice iteration, to use a familiar technical term in the software industry, um, and we'll often fail at doing it optimally, so we need to continue to work at it. It just plain old takes hard work and intentionality, which is another subject that I'll talk about a little bit later. One of the main concepts in Crucial Conversations that helped me to understand this is the framing of our path to action in any given situation. And this, along with something that I like to call empathy injection, which we'll take a look at a little bit later, um, these are the core concepts that I'd like to focus on for the remainder of this first section on understanding empathy. So in Crucial Conversations, the authors frame the way that we observe um, and respond to situations uh, in a couple of different ways. The first is sort of our narrow view and what we think of. We see and we hear a situation and then we act. And this is sort of our high level view um, without unpacking all of the different pieces of that. Let's use an example. Perhaps you're in the grocery store and there's a, a parent, maybe it's a mother or a father, and they're relating to their child poorly. Uh, perhaps the child is crying or frustrated um, and the parent just loses all of their self-control and temper and just yells out at the child in the middle of the grocery store. We see and we hear that, um, and then perhaps we take an action. Um, immediately, some thoughts start to come into your mind, even as I was relating that story. Maybe you've been in that situation before. Um, what are those sorts of things? Perhaps for me, it's something like, uh, well, that's a bad parent, or that they shouldn't lose self-control with their child. We start to make assumptions about people and we start to judge. And I think if we only consider our path to that action, the judgment or the um, the story that, that exists there in these two dimensions, we see in here and we act, we do ourselves a disservice because we're not really understanding one, um, where's the opportunity to empathize? And we just sort of get into this routine where that becomes habit and we never take a step back to sort of think about the way that we think. And so that's what I'd like to dive into. And that's what the, uh, the, the, the first introductory part of Crucial Conversations dives into. Um, our perception that the path to action is only comprised of see and hear and act um, reinforces that within us, but really there's a reality that there's more to that story. And so in Crucial Conversations, they break it apart into a couple of more steps in that process. So we see and hear that story, that parent in the grocery store um, behaving poorly in the context of dealing with their agitated child. Um, we tell ourselves a story when we hear that. So the story that I might have told myself was that person's a bad parent or they should have more restraint or self-control or they shouldn't be talking to their child like that and they're a bad person. Um, when we tell ourselves that story, then there's an emotional response that comes. And this is the step where we choose um, and we do choose. It's an active thing, even though we might not think we do. We choose the way that we feel. 
Um, and then as a result of that feeling, we might take action. Uh, the, the visual here is intended to indicate a number of ways in which we might take action. Uh, we might go into fight mechanism. We might get offended. We might actually lash out verbally. We might try to fix something. We might take the approach represented by the hammer icon there. Um, we might go and tell somebody else. We might talk behind that person's back if it's someone we know. In this case, if it's a parent in a grocery store, maybe we talk to the clerk and just say, oh, I don't know what's going on with that person. But yeah, I don't think they're a very good parent. And then the briefcase sort of as the other half of fight, which is flight. So we might actually just decide in any situation that we need to get out of there and, and withdraw or run away from the situation. This is our path to action in the reality. And I think if we're talking in terms of how to get better at empathy, there's also a fifth point in here, which is the point at which we can inject empathy into the equation. And this is what I like to call empathy injection. So the first four pieces of this path to action, these are all covered in crucial conversations. Um, the fifth piece is something that I've sort of observed in my own life. Um, and we'll take a look at some stories a little bit later that I can hopefully relate in a personal capacity, that there is a spot in between when you see and hear and react to something, you tell yourself a story and you have that emotional response. There's a point in the middle where we can empathize, where we can put ourselves in a position to change the story in step number two, to get a different emotional response. The challenge becomes that this is not an easy thing to do, especially if we're not in the habit of stepping outside of our current situation in real time, which takes a lot of mental capacity, and then stepping back in. But as we step out, evaluating what is the story that I'm telling myself about this parent in the grocery store? Um, perhaps it's that they're a bad parent. Is that the right type of story that I want to tell? How could I inject empathy into the equation? And I think a great way to start with that is to ask the question, well, why would a reasonable person, um, assuming that everyone is a reasonable uh, person, why would they respond in this way? And then maybe that can lead me to change the story that I'm telling. Maybe the parent had a bad day. Maybe um, they there's other things that would give me new context that would change my ability to empathize. And so these are the sorts of things that I start to, to think about when I look at getting to this path to action. So changing the, the story that I'm telling myself in that situation. What if perhaps the, the father or the mother just had a fight with their significant other that led to um, feelings of insecurity? Maybe they're looking at potential of facing divorce. If I put that in, that tells a completely different story. And I think most of us would be able to empathize with the person in that situation, why they're lashing out at their children in the grocery store. That can change the way that I feel instead of feeling angry um, or frightened or scared for the children. Maybe I feel sympathetic um, and that empathy enables me to feel that emotion. And then maybe I can take different steps in the action step instead of fight or flight. Maybe I can think of a way to fix that situation, say an encouraging word to that parent or something like that. So really, I think that as people in IT, we need discrete steps to help us improve at the empathy um, scenario or the, the empathy equation. And these are the pieces that I've experienced. And so I'd like to take just a few moments to relate stories uh, out of my own personal experience and hopefully show you the steps to that path to action that I took and how things could have been different. And in some cases, things were different in these uh, workplace scenarios. The first one that I'd like to relate to you is a story about a teammate of mine. And we were working together on a project uh, consulting for a client and the client was a challenging client. And in one instance, um, the client actually came to me and started a conversation about how he felt that uh, my teammate um, was inadequate in some way, incompetent. Uh, he wasn't as fast. He didn't understand the technology that we were working with. Uh, he just wasn't up to par as far as the, the, the client was concerned. This put me in a really awkward position and I didn't fully understand uh, the, the best way to handle it. And so I actually went through um, the following path to action. I heard the client relating that story. And uh, instead of thinking critically, I'm looking at this after the fact and sort of pulling this apart as a way of reflection. But in the moment, the story that the client was telling me was that my coworker was somehow incompetent. Um, and I started to believe that because I didn't really take steps to think about how I could inject empathy into the equation. Um, what was the reason that my client was having that opinion? Was there external pressure or things like that. 
So the, the story that I ended up believing was the one that my client was telling me, which was my coworker was somehow incompetent. The emotional response that I had to that made me feel awkward for, for being in that in, in the first place. But also, uh, once I started to believe that story, I felt like I, I needed to do something. I needed to take this to my coworker and, and, and have some sort of actionable item. And so the action that I actually took was I used all of those things that the client had um, as ammunition. And I went to my coworker and I said, hey, this is what the client's saying about you. And, um, you know, I kind of agree with some of these things, uh, even though if I would have taken some time to reflect, I would have realized what the source of that was instead of just internalizing that other person's story as my own. And so I ended up kind of loading up the gun um, and just unloading the bullets of all of these points that the client had made. Uh, and that that made my teammate feel absolutely demoralized and it was a horrible situation. And so that was the, in retrospect, looking at what my original path to action was. Let's take a look at what it would have been like if I would have injected empathy into the equation. So again, I've heard you know the story of the client coming to me and saying, "Hey, your your teammate is just not up to par. He, he I think he's just not a good fit for this project. He's incompetent. He doesn't he doesn't know what he's doing." Um, and the story that I could have told and related back to the client because this was the actual truth was that you know what you hired us as a pair of developers because we do pair programming. So really, uh, if you're unhappy with my pair, you're unhappy with me uh, because this is a reflection of us working together on this project. And I could have been able to empathize with um, with the client and say, you know, if you're unhappy, this is we're, this is a team game. We're in this together. And if there's something that I can do to help us deliver value to you better, then let's do that. But don't project all of your criticisms onto one person because really we're a team. I could have stood up and backed my teammate up in that scenario. And I didn't originally, um, but I was fortunate enough to get a second opportunity to handle it in this way. The client, after the first iteration of this, where I failed to sort of be empathetic about the situation, came back and tried to say the same thing again. And the second time I was able to implement the strategy that you see here, where I empathized, um, reframed the story that I was able to tell myself and the client. Um, and then that led to feelings uh, of camaraderie. We felt unified in our approach. And the action that ended up actually coming was we, we got back to work and we stopped sort of focusing on um, this negative cycle that was perpetuating itself. So that's just one scenario where I felt like I did a good job in empathizing uh, with, with my coworker, but it didn't come as my first initial reaction. And I don't think until I read Crucial Conversations, I would have even got to the point where I, I could have dissected this process and my thought process in order to get to the point where I was able to figure out that this is where I needed to inject empathy. I needed to change the story that I was telling myself. This is another uh, story, it's called The Project Manager. And I was working on a team, uh, a fairly diverse team of individuals, and we had a project manager and he was somewhat of a micromanager. Um, he would constantly put people under the microscope. And uh, our project wasn't necessarily behind, but we had um, estimation sessions where we would, as a team, come up with uh, the estimate for the amount of work that it was going to take within our iteration. And I believe if I remember correctly, our iterations were on a one week boundary in this project. So we had you know, 20, 20 points of work that we were committing to to get done. And on average, we would probably get done you know, 16 or 17. And according to the project manager on this project, that wasn't good enough. And so he would scrutinize heavily individuals on the team and sort of call people out in public uh, for what he perceived to be the reason for the lack of progress on this project. So what ended up happening was one time uh, when he was particularly agitated because we had fallen short of our of our estimate commitment for the iteration. Um, he sat everyone in the room down and started pointing fingers at people and sort of calling them out on on why they hadn't uh, achieved their their certain thing. And some people he, he praised because they had, but other people, um, he really singled them out in the group setting. And so one of those people was actually me. And so the, the thing that I saw him do was he pointed the finger at me and said, we brought you in because we need help in this particular area 
of, uh, of our team. We're lacking in this area and we're not seeing um, improvements in this area or people are still uh, unsure about this technology choice. Um, to be specific, they had brought me into the project because of my front end expertise uh, to help people improve at JavaScript. And they had surveyed the, the developers on the team and the overall response was that people didn't feel like they had improved enough. So he pointed me out in the middle of a meeting and said, why, why are we bringing you in people like you and we're not improving in this area? So the story that I told myself in that instance, uh, sort of deconstructing my thought process, was this is a personal attack from the project manager. He's just out to get me. Uh, he doesn't really care. And uh, it made me feel really kind of angry and upset. And my natural defense mechanism in a scenario like that is to take flight. Um, I usually don't fight right away when we're talking about flight or fight or flight as potential possibilities for action, I usually withdraw um, and just try to get as far away from the situation as possible. So um, in reflecting on my own personal life, that's been the pattern. And then I usually build up and build up and build up in this sort of withdrawn state until I get to the point where I just can't keep it in anymore. And then I explode in a fit of rage. And I think this is fairly common for people in IT, um, but we don't often stop to think about it. Um, in this instance, that was actually what happened to me. I ended up exploding in anger. Uh, it wasn't good. It wasn't a good place to be. Um, unlike the previous story, the teammate, where I was able to actually identify that and make change, um, this is the path, uh, the, the, the place where I could have injected empathy is mostly hypothetical. But in reflecting, I think that as soon as I saw and heard my project manager pointing fingers and being uh, accusing, um, the, the real information that I actually could have used that I knew was this project manager was actually on a performance improvement plan. And if you're not familiar with that, it, what that is, it's something that an organization will put an employee on when they're not meeting a certain qualification standard. So for example, this project manager was seen as being unproductive because the teams that he was in charge of were continually falling short of their goals. And so the story that I really should have been able to tell myself with that information was that his superiors were probably on his case. Um, Putting myself in his shoes, if I was on a performance improvement plan, that probably would have just demoralized me to the point where I didn't necessarily feel like even coming into work. How hard would it be to continue to come to work with the threat of being fired, um, kind of being held over your head with no real ability to impact things, as if um, whipping people into shape on development teams and pointing fingers is going to somehow magically get you better results in, in your software development projects. That's just not how things work. But if I took that information into context, the story that I told myself, uh, instead of feeling like it was a personal attack and he was out to get me, really, he's probably just under an incredible amount of stress. Um, that pressure was building to the point where he couldn't think straight, uh, his superiors were there, and he got to the point where he just kind of exploded, similar to how I withdrew, withdrew, and then exploded in anger in, in my response. So the place at which I think I could have injected empathy was changing that story that I told myself previously. So instead of him being out to get me um, in that personal attack, taking into the context that he was under a lot of pressure, and that reframing of the story could have given me an opportunity to empathize. And this is, again, the empathy injection point where I could have approached him and said, hey, I know that you're under a lot of stress. Um, I know that we continually aren't hitting our milestones. Is there something that I can do uh, that we can work together uh, to try and make sure that, that, we, that, that we do that? And I think if I would have done that in that scenario, that would have led to feelings of um, relief, probably on both sides, and a sense of purpose and a sense of mutual purpose that we could have come to uh, in step four there on feel, which would have led to action probably that we could have taken to implement steps. Uh, in this case, uh, it didn't. And this is something that I've taken a lot of time to think about scenarios in my past where I didn't inject empathy um, and with this knowledge in place after after reading crucial conversations to make an effort to really try to improve at this area so I feel um, un I feel regretful I guess not in a way that is impacting me negatively now but I think it's important to go back and look at scenarios in our life when we get new information about how we could have made a better judgment or made a better call or changed our emotional response and our action by telling ourselves a different story in that scenario. The last story that I'd like to tell you is called the phone call. And this uh, is actually a story where somebody else showed me empathy. Um, and there's some interesting dynamics that happen when uh, you're not always the one being empathetic, but you receive empathy um, from somebody else. And so the story is that I was, um, I had missed, I slept in 
and missed uh, an interview with a potential hire, and I missed uh, a stand-up meeting for our client. And the client had sent an email to my superiors in, um, and he was obviously frustrated that I had missed because there was a perceived lack of communication uh, and things were already kind of touchy on the project. And so I got an email that there was going to be a, a phone call. It was actually a, a, a Google Hangout with uh, two of the superiors to sort of talk about um, things at a higher level. Uh, and the wording in the email made me nervous about, uh, you know, what, what what was gonna happen. It was one of those phone calls, right? My, my dad used to call it the chat when you're gonna talk about something serious. And so in that scenario, I think one of the first things, um, the instincts that I had was to see and hear them set up that appointment uh, to to say, we need to talk about some things with the full knowledge that I had messed up. I had slept in on my alarm. I had missed a, a hire. Um, my the story that I started to tell myself was they're going to they're going to boot you out of the company because this is just unacceptable. Um, and I started to feel angry and I started to withdraw into myself um, and go into that sort of flight action that is that is my default. Um, I did never make it to that point, luckily, because uh, th this scenario happened at a point in life where I had sort of realized my, my inclination to these things um, and also learned to talk through some of these things uh, and get to dialogue instead of going to a fight or flight mechanic, which uh, Crucial Conversations op op um, often talks about. So when it ended up happening in this scenario was um, we had the, the phone conversation and uh, the, the story that I told myself before was they're not out to get me. They're not going to boot me out of the company. They just want to find out what's up. Why did I sleep in? Why did I miss the meeting? Is it is there? They're just looking out for my best interests. Um, and it turns out that that was actually what happened. And we had a really positive conversation where, where I was able to share sort of what things were leading me to the point that I was losing engagement with the particular project, um, why I had missed deadlines, and and some things that were internal that were that were causing me to feel frustrated, to feel isolated, to feel alone. Um, and they did a really great job of empathizing in that scenario uh, about ways that we can improve that that work scenario. And we talked about uh, things that could improve in terms of client engagement and the type of project that is best suited for me. And and we just talked about logistics and constraints and how some of those things can be challenging. Um, and it led to me feeling much better. It led to them feeling much better too. And we kind of came up with an action plan that, that resolved to fix some of these things going forward in the future so that I didn't feel necessarily left alone or isolated in that scenario. And that was a really powerful experience, uh, sort of being on the receiving end of empathy. And I think that there's an interesting thing that happens when we um, are in a position where we can project empathy and we understand how to pull apart this, this sort of path to our actions, find the point to inject empathy, but also when we're um, aware that other people also uh, have that information. And then there's a sort of a reciprocation that happens when I'm empathetic uh, to your situation. And I know that in response, you're going to be empathetic to mine. And we're working together to find a mutual purpose and a common ground. That to me is the ideal of a of a good functional team and a, and a healthy working team. And I feel like uh, understanding this with these three stories uh, and sort of breaking apart the path to action, this is the most practical advice that I've ever had to um, to that's really revolutionized the way that I think about empathy instead of sort of being the superpower that I don't understand how people who have it can, can react to breaking it apart into these steps of when I see and hear things, I tell myself a story and I need to reframe that story as a way that I can get to the point where I can inject empathy, asking the question, what would a reasonable person do to get to the point that they're at when I tell myself that story about what they're doing? that I can change my emotional response, which can lead to a change in action. And I think this is an, an incredibly powerful thing um, in IT. So that's the first half where we talked about uh, developing or understanding empathy. And the second half, I'd like to talk about um, cultivating empathy. And I think the, the thing that's interesting about it is it can begin as a solo process, but when we're thinking about working in terms of a group dynamic, as you can see with the illustration on the left, um, it's going to take a group effort um, to really change the dynamics of how we understand um, empathizing with people in our situations at work, in our teams and things like that. And the reason I have the guy on the right uh, with the, the pirate with the cannon is because sometimes we just need to blow out of the water our preconceived notions about what um, a normal, healthy team relationship works like where people are empathizing with each other. Uh, so sometimes um, we just need to forget what we've learned, uh, forget all the negative situations we've been in with teams that were unhealthy. Um, and from this point forward, start thinking of ways that we can come to solutions as a group um, in order to cultivate that empathy. 
But the focus of this section is really not necessarily on those group dynamics because I believe firmly that we need to start um, with ourselves and individual efforts that we can do to make ourselves change and, and have this change of heart and change of way of thinking. And so the first thing that I'd like to talk about is the concept that um, we need to understand that we all come as is. And I'm just going to read for you a, a segment from a book called Everybody's Normal Till You Get to, them, Till you get to Know Them by John Ortberg. And he says, in certain stores, you'll find a section of merchandise available at a greatly reduced price. The tip-off is a particular tag you will see on all the items in that area. Each tag carries the same words, as is. This is a euphemistic way of saying, these are damaged goods. Sometimes they're slightly irregular. This is the department if something's gone wrong. You're going to find a flaw here. A stain that won't come out, a zipper that won't zip, a button that won't butt. But there will be a problem. These items are not normal. We're not going to tell you what the flaw is. You'll have to look for it, but we know it's there. So when you find it, and you will find it, don't come whining and sniveling to us because there's a fundamental rule when dealing with merchandise in this corner of the store. No returns, no refunds, no exchanges. If you were looking for perfection, you walked down the wrong aisle. You've received fair warning. If you want this item, there's only one way to obtain it. You must take it as is. And when you deal with human beings, you have come to the as-is corner of the universe. Think for a moment about someone in your life. Maybe the person you know best, love most. That person is slightly irregular. That person comes with a little tag. There's a flaw here. A streak of deception. A cruel tongue. A passive spirit. An out-of-control temper. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but it's there. If we think back to the beginning where I talked about independence versus interdependence, I think this is one of the key points in really reframing the way that we think about how we operate in a team. I've been on teams where the focus was solely on technical expertise and people were rewarded for how well they could do that, not necessarily how well they were able to integrate people within a team to um, work together to solve a problem. And in each instance where I've been in a team like that, I think the fundamental flaw was that people fail to recognize the character flaws in other people, um, or even to just be aware that everyone has character flaws. Don't be perfect. I think when we get to the point where we recognize that everyone has an as-is tag, um, if we come into a group working scenario or a team scenario with that in mind, that helps us frame um, and maybe offset the surprise when we find out what that person's as-is tag is. If they're not visible. Not everyone wears them out on the front of their shirt um, like you see in the store, but they are there and we will encounter them. And I think we just absolutely need to understand that not everyone's perfect. Um, some people wear their heart on their sleeve. Some people are pretty cavalier with the way that they talk about things. And some people are very guarded and defensive. Um, and so we just need to recognize that. The next step, we actually need to identify areas of personal weakness. Uh, and I don't have an illustration for this at this recording. This is one of the last ones that I need to do to finish up. Um, but if I could just divert attention to one of the things and be totally transparent, that that is my area of personal weakness. Um, Historically, I have a challenge with seeing people in positions of leadership make mistakes and being extremely judgmental of them, assuming that uh, they're incompetent or that I could do a better job. That's my personal area of weakness. And I think it's important to identify your primary weakness so that you know what your as is tag is, uh, so that maybe when you're going to respond in a way that sort of would label you as a person who always responds in that 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 way with that as is tag that you become cognizant of that fact so that you can change your response so for me knowing that i have a predisposition to judge people in positions of leadership who make mistakes um, i really have to combat that and the way that i do that is by determining um, how to empathize with that person what would that person in position of leadership really want from uh, a person who's a subordinate um, they would probably want help um, they would probably want somebody to take initiation to come with solutions and of problems. And so when I find myself slipping into that area of weakness, being judgmental, one of the things that I have to do is come up with ways that I can sort of combat that and, and think, what would the other person want? Really try to empathize with them. Um, and I think it's important uh, to, to, to be able to cultivate empathy. We need to first identify those areas of per personal weakness. Um, maybe you just need to write it out on a list, on a piece of paper, but it's something that we absolutely need to do if we're going to cultivate empathy in our lives. The next thing, uh, it seems simple, but a commitment to cultivating a lifestyle of self-improvement. Uh, one of the things that I th 
that I found most helpful in life uh, in order to just start this path of cultivating empathy was looking at resources and actively soliciting people for resources. Um, at Test Double, we have a book list that we've started after our first company meeting, uh, which is a list of things that people find valuable for this idea of self-improvement or um, cultivating a lifestyle of self-improvement, things like books and podcasts, um, audiobooks, things like that. And so in addition to Crucial Conversations, there's other books that, I, that I've that i read and would recommend seven habits of highly effective people all these kind of self-improvement things but it, it takes a mental shift to move away to have an active commitment to saying there are things areas of weakness that i need to improve in my life um, and i need to make a commitment that i'm going to try and cultivate a lifestyle of self-improvement by reaching out to people and asking for those resources Kind of part and parcel with that is being able to identify weakness and cultivating a lifestyle of self-improvement. We need to learn the art of introspection. We need to pull ourselves apart. Um, sometimes the things that we're most weak at are hidden under layers of historical hurt, um, things that we've just not let go of in the past or dealt with. And this is all part of learning the art of introspection. And I think that um, there's not too much more to add here, but this just goes sort of hand in hand with uh, cultivating a lifestyle of self-improvement, figuring out what we need to pull apart to unpack um, those layers. And there's ways that we can do that uh, that will help us. Probably the best way is to find your people. I was at a talk in Ottawa recently at a meetup and uh, the talk was by um, Nicole Belanger and she said something that just absolutely resonated with me. She was in a job and she was absolutely miserable um, because she wasn't with her people and she took the job for the wrong reasons. And I think if we're thinking about ways to cultivate empathy in our lives um, and, and to grow it, we absolutely need to surround ourselves with people who are our people. So what do I mean by that? People who are your people are people who understand your heart, who understand what your path to action is going to be, um, and also who you are comfortable sharing what your desired change to the way that you approach that path to action is. And so those are your people, and you should try and find those people, people that are going to call you out um, when they see that what you're doing doesn't align with your stated goal of how you want to approach that path to action um, and making needed change. So find your people, surround yourself with them, build community with them. Um, those are those are more important things to to do when you're trying to cultivate empathy in your life. Once you've found those people, usually you can start to seek mutual accountability. And accountability is one of those words that's sort of mysterious and thrown out and not really well understood. But I think it's important to understand in, in the context of cultivating empathy, I think that seeking mutual accountability means um, inviting constructive feedback on the way that you approach your path to action. So in, in the, the graphic here, I've, I've got somebody that I trust that is one of my people that I feel comfortable sharing things that I might not feel comfortable sharing with other people um, about the way that I approach things, my personal weaknesses, things like that. And so I can ask her and say, hey, am I being a dummy? Am I, am I being stupid in this area? Um, and she can ask the same question, am I being stupid? And we can give each other that feedback to say, well, you said you wanted to do this and you kind of went and did this, but you know, maybe you should change and, and do these things in order to get back to that goal of how you want to approach your path to action and how you want to be able to inject empathy into situations. So finding your people and then being able to find someone within that group of people who you can seek mutual accountability with, I think is extremely important to being able to cultivate empathy. The, the other thing that sort of didn't really clue into me was and, until recently was is being intentional with relationships. And what I mean by that is there are gonna be those people that um, are part of your people group um, and you don't wanna always be uh, stuck with those people. You don't want it to turn into an echo chamber or a big massive group think where you're all agreeing with each other. The idea of mutual accountability uh, and your people is to find somebody who's going to challenge you and push you and try and sharpen you in the, the areas where you feel dull. And so what I mean by be intentional with relationships is there's gonna be people in those groups who, uh, you want to develop things, relationships with, um, and who you actively get benefit from uh, when you share information. And you need to think and prioritize who those people are. Um, make a schedule of how frequently you're going to call them. Make sure that you're reaching out frequently so that you continue to develop that relationship. Uh, it sounds silly to make a schedule and, and to do all these things, but I think being intentional about the people that we have in our, in our lives that are meaningful helps us to get to the point where we um, can regularly practice sharing things that we're not good at, sharing our weaknesses, um, sharing how we failed at 
getting to that stated path of action, how we failed at injecting empathy. And sometimes when we just don't know, uh, being intentional with those relationships helps us to get that feedback um, regularly. So that's what I mean by being intentional with relationships as a path to cultivating empathy in our lives. Another thing I think we need to keep in mind is that we need to be careful with ideals. Any group of people that we're in, any community that we're involved in, comes with a certain set of um, shared knowledge and ideas and understanding. And oftentimes in IT, we come to solve problems, technical problems, and we have ideals about how those should be solved. And I, f I find that if we're considering our teams as a community of people, um, we can actively destroy the things that our community stands for. If it's a team and, and we're working to solve a problem and we hold too tightly to those ideals, uh, instead of reaching out and trying to be empathetic, uh, we can actually destroy that community and destroy our teams. So the, the phrase that I really like is strong opinions weakly held. We've got ideals and it's okay to have ideals about the way that we solve problems, the way that we approach communication, the way that we think we should talk to people and how other people should talk to us. Uh, but if we get into a scenario where we hold too tightly to those things and not let them go, we run the risk of ruining those relationships or destroying the community and the relationships that we build. So we need to be very careful with ideals um, in the context of trying to cultivate empathy. We don't wanna destroy any of the goodwill that we've earned by doing all of the other things, intentional about relationships, um, being introspective, cultivating a lifestyle of self-improvement, all that stuff. We don't wanna destroy all that goodwill that we've earned by holding too tightly to what our ideals are. I think we should be flexible enough to hold on to our ideals, but if, if they need to shift, then we need to change them. So some things to remember, some core takeaways. We talked about a lot. We looked at sort of understanding empathy, understanding the path to action and how we can inject empathy in the equation in the middle there before um, we determine our emotional response to the story that we tell, our, tell ourselves, how to change that story that we tell ourselves in those situations in order to inject empathy. Um, the idea that everyone has an as-is tag, uh, that you're going to encounter that at some point to not be surprised by it. And uh, the more scenarios that you encounter where you um, discover people's as-is tags, the, the, the easier it will be when you are in more scenarios where you encounter other people's as is tags. Um, these are the things that I'd really like you to take away if you don't remember anything from, from this talk. Um, the as is, the path to action, cultivating a lifestyle of self-improvement, those resources, the books that I'm going to include in links, um, and then the concept of finding your people and really getting to mutual accountability, inviting constructive feedback on my stated approach and my path to action, the, the, the way that I want to relate to people, the, the place that I want to get to to be empathetic towards people. My name is David Moser. This has been the Empathy Equation. Uh, thanks so much for watching. If you have any feedback, please reach out to me on Twitter. And I really hope that you look into the resources that are available for this talk um, and commit to uh, focusing on how you can improve your empathetic capacity in whatever you're doing. Thanks so much.